Hey, my name is Thomas, and today I would like to talk about a camera that I love to look at, but I never shot it myself so far. It's the Argus C3. This is an American-made camera, which in itself is something special these days. Uh, of course, we know that uh, Kodak and the United States are basically the ones who really introduced photography to the masses with their film production and also making a lot of affordable cameras. But America is not well known for high-end cameras. This is also not really a high-end camera, but when it came out in 1939, it was pretty advanced for what it was. So it was made in Ann Arbor in Michigan. And they made them from 39 to 66, a whopping 27 years, and they produced more than 2 million of these cameras. So this is arguably like the first American folks camera, if you want to say so, in 35mm format. And it's got a coupled rangefinder and interchangeable lenses, so it's got a pretty good feature set. Basically, the company who made them, uh, they started in 31 or something like that as a radio company. So they used a Bakelite, which was back then a pretty new material, sort of an old plastics, a predecessor of plastics, very good for mass production. Uh, but they found out that radios were sort of a, a seasonal business because in the 1930s, people bought radios for use in the winter time when they were staying at home. And in the summertime, especially in America, uh, summers were pretty warm. People used to be outside and the radio was something that you didn't use all the time. It was like something special for leisure time. Uh, they didn't sell so many in summer. So they thought if they could make cameras, people would use cameras outdoors. In the summer, obviously, they could extend their business. And um, they also put a lot of backlight in this thing to make it more affordable. As many other cameras of the time, the major influence came from the Leica and a bit also from the Contax. In my opinion, the brick design of this thing, it really has something in common with the uh, Contax Model 1, at least from the front. From the top, you see the Argus is a pretty boxy, substantial thing, and it's also pretty heavy. But uh, yeah, it was a great, great success. And today it's also regarded as sort of a cult camera uh, with these, uh, I don't know, it looks like a steampunk machine or something like that. It really looks like a, you would ask AI to come up with a cool camera design, a steampunk camera design, and then you get the Argus. Fascinating stuff. So let's dive into the details. So here you've got your separated uh, viewports for the rangefinder and viewfinder, nothing else on the back. On top we've got, of course, the shutter button. This thing is the film counter. You have to manually um, reset it to zero whenever you put in your film. Uh, again, if there's film in it and you just took a shot, you have to push this button so you are able to start winding on and then you just wind on until it clicks. Uh, I don't have film in it so I can't really show it to you. There is a cold shoe, the earlier Argus C3 models didn't have that. Um, I have to actually look up what this is. I, <laughs> I will put it in the video, I don't know. Um, it had a cold shoe but again dedicated flash thing was via these two things and you would just get a dedicated flash and plug it in from here from the side. Um, the lens is interchangeable, and yes, I'm going to try to show you how that works. This is your shutter speed dial. Um, again, they might have different shutter times depending on the model year. This one runs from 300th of a second to 10th of a second, and you also have a B setting for long time, long time exposures. And this funny thing here, which feels actually hyper solid, listen to the sound. This really feels like something really heavy machinery going on there. Um, and also the click is very, well, it's a positive click, let's call it like that. Okay, from this side you push in here and then it opens the back like this. 
And again, as you can see, it's um, the film goes here. It's a bit the opposite to many other cameras and you wind it on this spool. Film rewind is this thing down here. And um, here you can also see the leaf shutter that's built in. It's a very ingenious design. It, it's a pretty good big leaf shutter. So that's why they were able to make um, interchangeable lenses for this. And let me see if I cock it. Oh, you see the tenth of a second doesn't really work on my camera. Now it's open, <laughs> but I can help it a little bit again. Yeah, it's sticky. Maybe if I operate it a little bit more. Ah, it comes back to life, huh? But that's longer than tenth of a second. But anyhow, that's how it works. Push again. And now it's closed. So these are the quirks and features of the Argus C3 camera. So this thing is also called the Argus C3 Matchmatic, which is sort of a submodel. And that means they have a green arrow somewhere here at 15 feet distance. There is a green arrow here on the aperture scale between a 5.6 and f8. And the 50th of a second here is also marked in green. And the idea of matchmatic means you just set it, all these three, the distance, the shutter time, uh, the aperture and the shutter time to the green setting and you're off, ready to go. It's uh, the manual says if you put it on these settings, you just have the perfect setting for every average situation, outdoor situation that you would encounter. So if you are not a very technical guy, just put it on the green settings and off you go. Super fascinating. Uh, they, the marketing was like they made it look like an automatic camera and it really was not an automatic camera. But I find that stuff very fascinating. It shows how easy it is to actually for me, it shows how easy it is to match uh, to to master the settings if you don't have a clue even and you still get a lot of good pictures nice actually there was a time back in the late 1940s where american camera industry had sort of a rise because the second world war was just over and america was the biggest economy of the time and america maybe was also the only country where there was a a quite big number of potential customers for cameras but cameras back in the day many of them were made the high quality cameras were made in germany and after the war they couldn't make cameras immediately again uh, after a lot of things were so sorted out you know so there was a couple of years like in 46 47 48 49 where the american camera industry really picked up and they started to introduce their own designs uh, to please the customers but it was just a few years because when German cameras were readily available, like in the early 1950s, again, uh, most customers was, would switch back to the German high quality cameras. But maybe that's also a reason why the Argus C3 had a huge uh, initial success in the 1940s, just after the war. And from then on, it just captured, yeah, it, it went on a couple of years more until, yeah, the 1960s. And uh, the Japanese, of course, they also started making great cameras in the late 1940s and they maybe started to conquer the American market also by time of the mid 50s. In Germany, it took a few years more. They really conquered the German market as well, but more, more in the late 1960s, early 1970s. For obvious reasons, this thing was called the brick and um, I've read in the internet, I'm not sure if it's true, um, apparently people back then liked the looks because it looked sort of professional in a way with all these cogwheels and dials. It looked like a serious tool. Well, to me it looks more like someone makes fun out of a serious tool, but taste was maybe different back then. And yes, it does look super cool today. Um, uh, I love this deep glossy black thing and all the chrome, which is pretty high quality because chrome is immaculate on this camera and um, all these styles. Yeah, it does look really cool. And I find that people who are not into cameras uh, love this thing. They just see it and find it looks super awesome. So yeah, I think the looks of this camera actually were a part of its big success. And it's also surely very, very recognizable. Quick 
quickly about the model history again. This is called the Argus C3. There was an Argus C, I think, that came out maybe in 36 or 37. Uh, I put the right here, here in the, uh, in the video. The C didn't have the coupling between the rangefinder and the lens. That meant you had to first use the rangefinder and then look at what setting it showed and then manually focus the lens. Many cameras back in the day had it like that. It's, it's very old fashioned, but that's how it started. Uh, the C2 added this coupling, which is this funny uh, cogwheel here. So it's kind of a very external coupling. And the C3 added the flash sync, which comes here and you put on the dedicated flash here. So after that, they didn't really change anything. There are many, there are some small changes, like some cameras here have a phone remind dial on it. And sometimes this lever is chrome and here it is black and stuff like that. But overall, this camera remained pretty unchanged for 27 years. Again, something crazy from today's point of view. The good. Well, this thing has a pretty good feature set, as I said before. We've got a coupled rangefinder, and you can use this thumb wheel here to operate it, which on my camera is almost solid, frozen solid. But that's because it wasn't used for many decades, I think. Um, we've got a pretty good uh, shutter speed range from 300th of a second down to 1 10th of a second plus B, of course. Um, you can interchange the lenses. There was a 100mm lens for this thing and a 35mm wide angle. And it also has a flash sync, which is really cool for a camera of that vintage. Uh, you would attach a dedicated flash unit just to the side here. No cables, no nothing. And then you would have a flash like this. I'll show you a picture. Um, so the feature set of this thing was really, really good for its time and also good for the price. There's also a lot of bad things when using this camera from today's perspective. In my opinion, the most glaring omission is that it doesn't have any sort of double exposure prevention. So what you do is you use this thing to cock the shutter. But as you see, you can take... <laughs> You can fire and fire and fire without winding on the film. So the film wind is here. Um, it's on the wrong side, so to speak. Uh, this camera, you put in the film on the right and it winds to the left. Kind of unusual, but it works. That's not a problem, but you can wind and you can cough the shutter. There's nothing that prevents you from taking double exposures, which is cool if you want to take double exposures. There's no camera where it's more easy than this, but it's also bad because you always have to remember that. And um, the controls in general are a bit weird. So, for example, you, if you shoot and there's film in it, then after that you have to push that thing to be able to wind on, uh, which is a bit old-fashioned, let's say it. And also this thing here is not maybe the last word in ergonomics, and uh, no one knows why the shutter speed dial is in front here. Well, I think it's because it's a leaf shutter and it's easy to mount the dial here. It's easier than to put it on the top, but Ergonomically speaking, this is all a bit weird. Uh, the big brick shape, by the way, is not really a problem because I think it, it actually, it's pretty solid in the hand. And if you put your pinky down here, you get a really good grip on this thing. So it's not all bad. And, but what is also bad is of course the viewfinder. It's really dim and small, but that was usual for the day. Even the screw mount Leicas have small viewfinders. From back then, there's nothing to complain about it, but today it's not nice. The most crazy thing about this is how you exchange the lens. And I'm going to try to do it now. Just unmount this lens and replace it. Um, it's really funny how they did it, but I think it works. So let's have a go now. So let's try to change the lens. Uh, it says in the manual that you have to unscrew the cover of this thing. Oh, first you have to set the lens, sorry. You have to set the lens to nine feet. Well, it is on nine feet, I was lucky. So uncover this thing now, uh, unscrew this thing, take out this cockwheel. Can't believe. <laughs> okay, now you can unmount the lens. 
as you see, it's a screw mount. It's very, yeah, it's on, on it's a special Argos screw mount. You now also can see the leaf shutter here. And um, again, there were three lenses made apparently. This is the American made Sintar 50 millimeter f3.5, which has a very good reputation. It should be a pretty sharp lens, especially when you step down a little bit, but really good lens. And then there was a 100 mil f4.5 and a 35 mil f4.5. And if I read it correctly, those were made in Germany by Steinheil, but I'm not sure if that is really true. I haven't seen any of these lenses in person. So if you look carefully, and here's a part of cock, yeah, teeth. It's like a cock wheel and this part is smooth. So what you do is when you put on the lens, when you replace the lens, you make sure that the center of the cock wheel stuff sort of, wait, I'll show you in a minute. The center of the cock wheel stuff should be facing here, this cock wheel. So it has enough leeway both sides, but I'm not sure if that's really the perfect um, adjustment. Then you put this back on and it's on nine feet, which is also like sort of the center of the settings and um, you replace this. But my advice is check the camera manual. Maybe I did it wrong. Um, check the camera manual. It's available on cameramanuals.com, the Budkus website. I put the link in the description and um, then don't make any mistake because I get this, that this alignment of the cockwheels is super, <laughs> super important. Otherwise you get a lot of uh, ruined exposures because of the sharpness isn't perfect. So make sure you get it right. Uh, but that's it. A camera with interchangeable lenses, 35, 50 and 100. That was pretty cool back in the day. And, um, but I think the 35 and 100 millimeter lenses are maybe much more rare than you normally get this with a 50mm lens. Okay. The awesome about this thing, again, 27 years of production, it wasn't almost not changed. Um, I think in 1966, it was pretty, pretty old fashioned and showing its age, but people really loved the shape. It was an iconic camera already back then. And it did everything that an amateur would ask for only when new things like automatic exposure built in exposure meters would come up this camera didn't have it and then people were ready to finally jump to japanese cameras um, uh, which were much more modern in 1966 but um it's a basic tool from today's point of view it was already basic in 66 but it had all the things that you really need to make a good picture fantastic lenses they're actually pretty good and um, there were a couple of professional photographers using this camera as well. So I think the most well-known is maybe Tony Vaccaro. Uh, he was in the Second World War in the US Army and he covered, for example, D-Day in Normandy using an Argus C3 camera. And there's a lot of shots from him from the Second World War that are pretty famous. Um, it was not made, uh, it wasn't a camera for the professional, but professionals, yes, they did use them uh, and had good success sometimes. So it has some awesomeness built into it. It's very easy to find these cameras today. And if you clean the mechanism and also the lens, the lens in this one is a bit hazy, which is one of the reasons why I don't shoot this camera. Um, but if you just give it a good cleanup, chances are that it will still work perfectly today. It doesn't have a lot of complex mechanics that can go wrong, like um, self timer or I don't know, any electronics or anything like that. So this is pretty easy to service and a very good American style. It's like, it's like an old Chevrolet. It will always run. So um, chances are you can still use it today if you want to, which is nice. So that's it for today. It's a short video, but I hope you learned something interesting about this awesome classic camera, American classic camera. Um, they are fairly easy to find even in Europe, but of course it's much easier to find one of these back in the USA. I don't think they were really sold in Europe in big numbers because there was always some European cameras alternatives for the customers over here. But these are very, very, very common in the USA. So. Maybe you want to find one and try it out for yourself. Uh, then have a lot of fun and be prepared for some learning curve, but it should give you very good results as well. 
So, happy hunting, have a great time, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.